Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to do why worry. Uh, you know, a lot of people go off on tangents and they forget the promises of God. Get all uptight, come unstrung, just lose it all. There's no need in that. You have a Christian has every right in the world to be secure, be on the ball, take care of business, and get it done. That's, that's the way God created us. And when you focus and discipline yourself in His Word, you know, that's what a, the word disciple, which is student, comes from the word discipline. And you have to discipline yourself. Uh, and, and, and you can, you know, many people think, well, if you're disciplined, you never have any fun. Wrong. Disciplined people have more fun than anybody, okay? Just get that out of your head coming out the gate. Disciplined people enjoy things more than anyone else, and, um, and, and they don't have to worry. That's, that's one of the beauties, because why? Kind of to worry is to doubt all of God's promises, and secondly, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like for you to doubt him. Why? He loves you. We're going we're gonna to begin with chapter, let's just let the word um, tell us why we shouldn't worry. And first we're going to start with Luke chapter 12, and Christ is going to mention a thing or two you should at least be concerned about, okay? Chapter 12, the great book of Luke, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Verse 1 reads, In the meantime... When there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, there was no end to it. Insomuch that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, the idea being like at another time when he fed a great multitude, he said, You beware of the crumbs you pick up. And he wasn't talking about bread, he was talking about doctrine. Anytime you get a large group of people together, you're going to have some bad teachers there. You're going to have some bad people. You're going to have some know-it-alls in the way of the world that think they're God's gift to the world, and they're going to be planting seeds, and they're not something you want in your garden, okay? And so he's saying, beware. That means you be careful. Uh, why? Well, you're, if you open your life to that, if you're undisciplined in knowing what is not God's Word, not recognizing hypocrisy when it comes your way, it can poison your life. It can, it can next to destroy you with worry and, and uh, darkness, depression, when there's no need in it. Absolutely no need whatsoever. Okay. Beware then of that, that's, that's the heart, of, now that would give you something to worry about, okay? But still, the worry wouldn't do you any good, okay? Verse 2, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be made known. They're, they're, what they're doing is going to be uncovered. Good, bad, the ugly, all of it. It's going to be made known. And th this means... Um, God always uh, gives you the Word, the Logos, and the Logos is going to let you find them out, whether it be false or whether it be true. You sure never want to study with someone you find in great error all the time. Otherwise, you're having to spend more time double-checking that person and their teachings than you're going to gain. Verse 3, Therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, Whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. In other words, when, when you pray in your prayer closet and God gives you a truth, gives you a leading, an unction, well, you're supposed to, if you ever want anything again from God, as you've heard me say many times, you better proclaim it. You better, you better plant that seed somewhere because somebody, besides you, you needed it, but others did do as well. And um, <clears throat> this is how you please God, is to follow what he says. You proclaim it. 
Verse, that goes, again, good, bad, the ugly, okay? Verse 4, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. That's the flesh. And after that, have no more they can do. There's not a thing in the world that false teachers can do to your soul. They could even put a hit out on you and destroy you, but they cannot blemish your soul. It can't be touched. It can't be harmed. Only God. You know, we just covered that very recently in Matthew, uh, back in chapter 10, verse 28, where it says, Fear only he who can cause your soul to perish, and that's your heavenly Father. Why? He's the judge. Verse 5. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, that's to say the body, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. He that can send your, the word here, if I remember correctly in the Greek, is Gehenna, which is symbolic, symbolic of hell, the lake of fire. That's the one you want to fear. Why? He has the authority and the power to end your eternal life. Or if you ever had any hopes of having eternal life, he can nip it in the bud. And I don't care how, how old you are or how many years you've been around compared to forever, it's nipping it in the bud, okay? Why? God does not wish a misfit to be in heaven. That is to say the eternity. Don't need a misfit there or we'd be back in the same mess all over again. So revere God. Respect him. He knows what he's doing. He, and, um, and God loves his children. And uh, that love, uh, to question it, is a sin. Why? Well, let's read on. Verse 6. <clears throat> Are not five sparrows sold for two fourthlings? That, that's less than a half cent apiece, okay? And, and not one of them is forgotten before God. God loves his animals. God created all animals. People wonder about their pets. He knows about every little sparrow out in the wild that if a human hand never touched it. And he created all things for his pleasure. Okay. And, and who are you? Verse 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. A whole flock of them, you're more valuable. Well, God loves you. You're his child. This is why you want to be real careful about worry. In as much as he has proved his love for you over and over and over, for you to still worry, knowing he's going to take care of a little old bird. And here, a thing like you, who's the very hairs in your head numbered by him, and you're doubting mercy. You know, what does it take? You can begin to see how that worry is a big waste of time because God knows and God cares about those that mean business, those that discipline themselves. It's real easy to relate to somebody that took the wrong path if you're not careful. All I can tell you is don't take the wrong path. That's stupid. You, you, stupid does as stupid does. You don't want to be stupid. You want to be wise and loving in our Father's Word. Listen to Him and be blessed. He loves you. Every hair on your head numbered. Verse 8. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Think about that. Well, who am I? You're somebody he's going to confess before the angels of God. This, this word confess is made up of two Greek words, homo meaning of the same kin to the same kind, like uh, that's Christ. And logos, of course, is to speak out, to, to, uh, ob uh, to enjoy the contract, the covenant, the covenants of God, to teach them, to share them, to confess them. 
to take his word forth, plant seeds, it makes his day. And even the angels in heaven will know. Um, I don't know, do you have a destiny? Boy, how could one read that and not realize? Verse 9, but he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Can you imagine these people that snicker at the, the name of God? Can you imagine these people that try to destroy the history, the name of God, and anyone that follows him? Talk about being in danger. Talk about hell bent for the lake of fire. Let them be. Who knows, but what even they, you know, <clears throat> I, I can say that I've known a few atheists in my lifetime, but I've noticed a strange thing. Once it is pronounced a sentence of death on them, whether it be a disease or anything else, they change. 90% of them change. They become Christians. They become believers or believers in something. Okay. I guess that's why we could say in the military there are no atheists in a foxhole. So that, that's their problem, all right? We don't have to worry about that. But to be denied by the Father that created your very soul is a terrible, terrible thing. Verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now, this is why you want to go back to the beginning, and when he warned you, beware of hypocrisy. False teaching, it's dangerous. What is he talking about here, friend? Anything that Jesus, as he walked the earth, the logos... Uh, uh, even if you, uh, the homologous, uh, the confessing of him, if you don't participate in that. But what is, uh, even you could, you could disagree with the teachings and repent and still be in good standing. But for those that know the truth, those that know that the false Christ is appearing first and refuse the Holy Spirit, to speak through them, it is unforgivable. We're talking about the unpardonable sin right here, what it actually is. Now, that's something to be concerned about. <clears throat> well, when would that take place? Verse 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues, this is the synagogues of Revelation 2.9, the synagogues of Satan, not a synagogue today. And unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Do you know why? Verse 12. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. That is the hour of temptation. That is the five-month period that the spurious Messiah will be here. If you refuse, when you know better, I'm sorry, it's all over. And you know what? You would have been one of God's, you were God's elect. So uh, personally, do I think this is possible? No, I do not think that is possible because we of the election who know the false Christ is coming to deceive our kin. We find him in that hour of temptation. And that's the hour that's being spoken of here, the hour of temptation. We don't find Satan tempting and no Christian should. And they should stand against him when he comes to say, I'm coming to fly you away. I'm coming to rapture you out of here. Biggest revival the world will have ever known. And will it be tempting to jump in his wagon? I don't think so because we find him to be an abomination. Disgusting. To the lowest degree. And you got something to worry about and you live in this age that even some of the prophets wanted to live in this to have the opportunity. Make certain that you take and beware and heed his warning. Here he has told you, you don't have to worry, even the sparrows are numbered. But there's something coming and he said, I want to forewarn you. 
I want to forewarn you so that you know beforehand that you can speak against the Logos, the Word, but don't go against the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, when He wishes to speak through you. Those of you know that we're talking here about, we're reading the 11th verse. Read the th 11th verse of Mark chapter 13. It tells you the destiny of any Christian that um, will participate basically in the first resurrection or one that has not already, but of the last day. I'll say it again. This is the 11th verse of Luke 12. Read the 11th verse of Mark 13. You have the same thing, only it goes into more detail. It gives you all seven events that transpire that are the seven seals, seven trumps, and seven vials. Beware that hour. That is a five-month period according to Revelation chapter 9. Is that something for you to worry about? No. It's something for you to take great uh, honor and prestige that God would utilize you, who he considers to be very valuable. And if you confess him, if you confess, if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, through the covenant he has made concerning the end times, homo kin, same like, just like Jesus, that you carry the same word through the Holy Spirit, that you become a part of the family of overcomers. That's so very important. Verse 13, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he's given us a little warning here in line with this. And 14, and he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? In other words, what he's saying here, I, I didn't come to teach law. You've already got the law. I came to save sinners. That's what my mission is. And I'm telling you how to do it. Part of it is don't worry. And your little old precious property here on earth, it doesn't amount to that much, okay? Verse 15, and he said unto them, take heed, here's another warning, something you, want, you don't want to worry, but you want to be concerned about. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Um, life, um, eternal life has nothing to do with riches here. And you want me to say that again? I mean, hey, God's blessing and riches are wonderful. All right? Don't ever apologize for them. If God blesses you with, with uh, plenty, he has promised he would. So don't, don't ever make an apology for it. But at the same time, don't think that's what establishes your eternal life. It doesn't. Okay. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, this will better clarify. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Oh, I mean, it was a producer. 17. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to restore my fruits. In other words, I got more than I can use. What in the world am I going to do? Well, you know, you might, as a Christian, think about somebody that needs a little something. You know, got it? Instead of coveting so much uh, that uh, you can't even take care of it. 18. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will I bestow all my fruits and my Good. My, my, me, me, I, I. 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I've found my, I've, I've got it made. Now, you want to remember something. Fear not he who can kill the flesh, but do you know who owns your soul? Ezekiel 18.4, God owns all souls. You don't ever give your soul to God. He's got it. It's his. You're his child. You are his to do with as he chooses. And bless your hearts, you know, a person that doesn't make the cut is not even trying. They're not even trying to participate in salvation. Therefore, they shouldn't make it. 
So uh, uh, here, he, here he says, I've, I've got it, and he probably is going to tear down uh, good material that he could have shared. So when he says, my soul, I'm going to tell my soul something, you want to be real careful. Your soul doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? You know, we buy land and we have the title to it and your little old names on it. Sometimes you ought to look and see how many names are on that title before you had it, you know. And do you know who it really belongs to? Really? I mean, let's face it, it's God's, okay? So you want, you want to be real careful in that sort of thing. I, I'm not telling you that, again, uh, uh, be thankful when God blesses you. But don't let it rule your life or, or, or your soul. It has nothing to do with your eternal life, basically. Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I mean, if, if you're not rich toward God, earthly wealth is really not that much. You know, it's really not that much. Verse 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought. Do you know what this word thought is in the Greek? Worry. Take no worry for your life. What you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. In other words, if you pick a profession and you work at it, don't you think I can feed you? Don't you think my good earth can take care of you if you work at it? He's not talking here to lazy people. You understand? God hates lazy people. But um, uh, working people, he says, don't you worry. Verse 23, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Now think about that a minute, absorb it. Don't worry, is what he's saying. That life, that is your eternal life, is more than what you're going to eat. Okay. And your body is the building in which your eternal uh, body dwells. That's to say your, your spiritual body, 24. Consider the ravens. Now, if any of you don't know, I guess that's related to the, the crow family. Okay. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are you better than the fowls? What, what have you got to worry about? He's told you earlier, I forewarn you, hey, confess me, and I'll confess you before the angels of God. Do my work, and if I can take care of the crows, the ravens, do you think for one moment I can't feed you or take care of you? Verse 25, and which of you? With taking thought, that's to say, which of you that takes worry can add to his stature one cubic? I really like this. Which of you think that worry will add one single minute to your life? If anything, you can just subtract it. It'll put you in the grave earlier. And it will do absolutely not one bit of good. And many say, well, I, I, know, I worried about it and it didn't happen. <laughs> Give me a break and get a life. You know, uh, if, if God loves you and promises he'll take care of you, say, tell me again why you think it didn't happen. Did you pray about it maybe a little bit? Did you give God credit? He cares. If he cares about a little old sparrow, do you think he doesn't love you? Give me a break. Worry will not add one minute to your life. It will shorten it. 26. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? If, if you can't uh, uh, worry about, if, if you're going to worry about little bitty things, why in the world, why do you think it would do you any good to worry about the rest? It wouldn't. 27. He says, you stop and you think for a minute. Consider 
The lilies, how they grow, they toil not. They don't even work at it. They spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of those. I take care of them. Relax, worry doesn't help you a bit. You just take care of your little old business, do your profession. You'll have clothes to wear. I'll see to it. Verse 28. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith, you doubters? So you just doubt on and doubt on. And boy, that's doubting our Heavenly Father. And you know something? It does not make him happy, not one iota. Well, I just had, I, and, and we have worry warts. Hey, that it's, there are some people that are more prone to it than others. Is it insecurity, perhaps? Is it the way they were raised? Maybe. But you've always got the Word of God to come out of it to learn, to discipline yourself, to become a disciple, a disciplined disciple, and to take care of business. Primarily, that's what it is. Let me tell you something. If somebody is all uptight and worried, your ability, your creative ability to fix a problem to see through a problem and to do it correctly, even to see through a problem that God is helping you see through. If you let worry slip in and get up tight and just panic, God can't deal with that. How can he help you if you're worried? Worried won't help you one iota, my friend. And uh, again, as I said, there are some people that are just worry warts, but don't, God does not particularly enjoy doubters, so fix it. Well, and how do I stop worrying? Be a believer. Let that shock you into seeing a Christian should be a believer. Be a believer. Get out there, do your best, and let, let God take care of the stuff you can't. But you do your very best, and you'll always come through shining like a rose, okay? Don't be a doubter. Next verse, please. Verse 29. And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. Don't worry. Stop it. Trust him. Why? Verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that you have need of these things. He knows it. You don't even have to tell him. It doesn't hurt to tell him, but you don't have to search for daily bread if you use your brain that God gave you in your profession and guidance and don't be a lazy body, you're going to do just fine. God is going to bless you, and you don't have to doubt anything. The main reason, and the reason we came here, is it, within the next two verses. Let's cover them. 31. But rather, on the other hand, this is what you do. Seek ye the kingdom of God. That's the king and his dominion, to be pleasing to it to fulfill your obligations to the king. And all these things shall be added unto you. He will see to it. He will guarantee it. You do the work toward the kingdom, and you strike pay dirt. He'll take care of it. It is his blessings. Otherwise, you're a worrywart and a doubter, and he's not going to help you. Hey, you know, to let that kind of power slip by for a believer is uh, pretty, and you, you've got something to worry about, all right, when all you have to do is love him. And he says, I know what you have need of. And once you seek the kingdom, that is to say to love the king and his dominion, and take the word and deal in it, discipline yourself in it, I will add all these things unto you. I'll give them to you. I'll see to it. 
And you can believe that, my friend. 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. All things were created for his pleasure, and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's to say the king and his dominion. And wh what are you worrying about? Well, I, I'm about out of milk. My garden looks a little wilty. What about your soul? What about your life? What about the king? What about his dominion? What about important things? Now, let me ask you something. Have you, have you, um, that word confess, which is homologos, the logos being the word even, if you would, speak, a speaker to the covenant of God. Have you confessed him? That's what brings the blessings. Following him, the good word makes you a very, very happy person because it makes him happy. It is his pleasure to give it to you. And when you pleasure God, certainly as you've heard me say many times, he's going to pleasure you. I'm, I'm going, I want to go back to Matthew chapter 18 to close this. Just one verse. Matthew chapter 18. I want to show you what kind of father we serve. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10. There is one thing. When God makes his promises, when God gives you the word which you're supposed to plant and help pass on, you see, beloved, the word that encourages you, do you think it won't encourage somebody else? If you just share a little of it, you're going to be like the old boy, I'm going to keep it all in my barn. If my barn won't hold it, I'm going to build a bigger barn. Uh, you better watch out that stuff or he'll take your life, bam, just like that. And guess where the old man went? Went to hell. Might. God is so loving. And it gives him, and when it gives God pleasure to do something, do you think it's going to be difficult to get him to do it? Is that, can you reason that out with common sense? Verse 10, chapter 18, the great book of Matthew in closing. Verse 10 reads, Take heed. This is, you be careful. Not, he didn't say worry. He said, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. That's to say God's set aside ones, God's elect. For I say unto you that in heaven, now this is right now, in heaven, that's where God is, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. In other words, if you have a crew like that looking over you, looking out for you, why would you worry about something? <laughs> I just have to worry. Why? When God's own, your angel has the face of God at any time that you're in trouble. You kind of got it made, don't you, friend? When you get right down to it where the rubber meets the road, you kind of got it made when you're a servant of God and are disciplined in his word. And I would ask again, why worry? It's a waste of time and a waste of life. Again, uh, knowing um, the uh, anatomy of man and the makeup, the mental um, uh, stages, when your mental condition is in depression or worry, it does not function properly. You cannot think straight. You cannot act straight. And what brings it on is worry. And you got the promises of God in heaven that you're being looked out for when you try. You know, I can say this a little different way. God said, I'm watching, I'm watching. I know what you have need of. And when you seek my kingdom, that is to say, when you want to work your way into seed planting and studying and getting into the Word of God. I'll pay you. Until then, bye. You know, that's, that's where most people's trouble is, and that's why you should worry. If you don't seek the kingdom, if you don't study the Word, I don't, I'm not telling you to become a religious fanatic. I'm saying everything in good taste 
in everything in moderation and let him know that you love him and don't you ever hold back from telling him that you love him and you appreciate the fact you don't have to worry. We're going to do another cut on this in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please?